So in this chapter, the bending moment and the shearing force solutions for a beam will be presented as a particular example of everything that we studied so far in continuum mechanics. So we have studied the stress, and then after that we studied uh, the deformation and the strain. Then we studied the constitutive laws and the equilibrium equations. And we're going to use all those concepts that we uh, studied to develop uh, a differential equation for the beam and solve it to find solutions of deformations for the beam. So in general, a beam has a shape similar to this. And as it deforms, every point on the beam would have a certain deformation and there's no reason why you would end up with a beam after deformation that looks like this where every point this is the undeformed configuration and this is the deformed configuration and for every material point with a location x there is a new location small x that tells me where this point went and the deformation is usually or could be non-homogeneous or non-linear however in order for us to uh, be able to solve the differential equation of equilibrium we apply certain approximations for the beam and these approximations allow us to do the following when we look at a beam under the umbrella of structural analysis we take all the beam and every cross section we assume that this cross section stays after deformation stays plane so all the points however many points there are on this plane after deformation they maintain being on a plane now this is an approximation but a really bad approximation after uh, years of experiments a uh, really long time ago they realized that this approximation is valid for beams and allow us to come up with allow us to come up with uh, solutions for the beam uh, that really uh, mimic its physical behavior and by doing so if I now draw the cross section or draw the side view of the beam if I draw some planes that are perpendicular to the neutral axis or the centroid of the beam after deformation what we're assuming for it to be a beam that if this is the new centroid that these original planes that were perpendicular to this neutral axis or the centroidal line stay plane and even stay perpendicular and so this is a major restriction on the possible deformation function which allow us to find solutions as we will see for the equilibrium equation so there are three major assumptions Oh, there Bernoulli's beam under bending. This is the, 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 the beam that, or the, the beam model. 
that is used into 70 CV270 and CV372 or in any any beam analysis adopts this Euler Bernoulli's beam model there are three major assumptions behind this beam model the first assumption is that plane sections perpendicular to the neutral axis before deformation stay plane not only that but also perpendicular to the neutral axis to the neutral axis after deformation so these lines stay perpendicular after deformation and the second assumption is small deformations we always assume in beams that our building that we're building this uh, that we're building out of these beams will exhibit very small deformations so that this exaggerated deform this is an exaggerated deformation shape this this deflection will be very small and because we're using small deformations I'm allowed to use the small strain matrix which will equal to half the gradient of view plus the gradient of view transpose and the third assumption is that the beam is made out of a linear elastic and isotropic material so it's really limited you can't use uh, I mean so the, the, all the equations that you all, all in the courses in all the courses that you're studying you're really limited to small deformations and limited to most of the time to linear elastic isotropic material and to this plane sections remain plane in fact in most beams we also ignore the effect of Poisson's ratio and that allows us to solve the beam equation really fast and using hands calculations and this all this as we will see leads to a differential equation of equilibrium that you saw before that relates the deflection of the beam which is this is the beam before deformation and let's call this x1 and this is x2 after deformation small deformation so I'm gonna s stay use the same well let's for now use small x1 small x2 the neutral axis deforms and the unknown is this y this deflection function y what is y and to find y we have to solve a certain differential equation that's related to the load q as we will see in the derivation in this chapter okay so how do we come up with this equation using what we have studied so far in continuum mechanics so let's start from the beginning derivation in beams we are as we said we are interested in everything that happens on a certain cross section so instead of looking at a point where at this point we have sigma on 1 sigma on 2 and sigma on 3 we are going to integrate all those stresses on the cross section so instead of looking at sigma on 1 on a point I'm going to look at all the force that's in the direction of sigma on 1 on the whole cross section so I'm going to 
find something called the normal force which is the integral of the those small stresses on so the normal force is the integral of the sigma on one o integrated over the cross-section area and similarly for instead of calculating the shear stress at one point which is sigma on two in this direction I'm going to calculate I'm going to take sigma on two and calculate all the, the the stresses here integrated over the area to get a shear force and this shear force I'm going to call v12 however when these beams when these beams were developed a long time ago they defined the positive shear in this direction but we defined the positive stress in this direction and so the positive shear is equal to negative sigma 1 2 or the integral of sigma 1 2 dA and similarly we're defining v13 but we're looking at plane beams so for this we're not going to look at v13 we're also interested because now we're looking at a whole cross section we're interested in how sigma 1 changes on that cross sectional area when sigma on one changes along this whole cross section area, so let's look. If sigma on one is, for example, going in this direction, and sigma on one here is going in that direction, then this creates what we call a bending moment on that cross section. So we're looking for this bending moment on that cross section area. So this moment will be equal to the integral of that stress or the small force multiplied by the distance. Now this distance is in the direction of x2 and I call this the positive sorry I call this the positive moment m33 I call this the positive so the positive moment is equal to negative the distance x2 multiplied by this force which is equal to the sigma on 1 ta so m3 is equal to negative x2 sigma on 1 dA. and the reason why it's negative is because when we define the positive moment it, moment on the cross section it's going in this direction and we and similarly for the shear you can also define a moment around x2 or around this axis it's called m2 and you can also define a torsional moment but for because we're doing some two-dimensional beams we're, we're analyzing two-dimensional beams we're not going to look at these we're going to assume that they are zero so this is the first step in uh, in deriving the beam equations is that instead of the stresses we look at forces on a cross-section area which are basically the integral of the stresses that we defined earlier Now, when we studied the equilibrium equation, we reach an equation that says partial sigma 1 1 by partial x1 plus partial sigma 2 1 by partial x2 plus partial sigma 3 1 by partial x3 plus rho b1 is equal to 0. This was valid for a continuum and this is valid for a beam as well. However, because we have done some integration, we, we prefer to write the equilibrium equations not in terms of those stresses but in terms of those what we call internal forces that are equal to the uh, integral of those stresses so in order to write an equilibrium equation or any differential equation we need to assume that something is continuous so uh, we have we are starting from shear which is v12 normal force and moment so if this so we've got normal uh, sorry v12 and m3 and if this is the length of the beam i assume that the shear force is continuous over the length of the beam and sm uh, smooth and uh, also m3 is continuous and smooth across the length of the beam so 
what does this help me do? It helps me do the following. If I pick any point on the beam, and I say that the shear at this point is equal to V, then a little bit further on the same beam, after a distance delta x1, I can say that the shear at this point is equal to the same V plus a little bit more. What's this little bit more equal to? It's equal to partial V by partial x delta x1 plus even other terms but they're very small and when delta x1 is very small this term is enough is an enough approximation to tell me what the shear is after a small distance and it's the same with the moment if the moment here is m then the moment after a distance, a very small distance, delta x1 will be equal to the same moment plus a little bit more. And this little bit more is equal to partial m by partial x1 multiplied by the distance dx1 plus a little bit more, which can be ignored. Okay. So you end up with this shape. So I have this beam. The beam has, I only assume that the load is going, is on top of the beam in this direction. I have a distributed load on top of the beam that's equal to Q force per length along X1 axis. And then I'm going to extract a small sliver of the beam. And look at that sliver of the beam. I'm gonna put the normal force on one side and on the other side I have the normal force plus a little bit more shear so let me just draw it in plane or side view if this is the normal force and this is delta x1 this is the normal force plus a little bit more a little bit more if this is the positive shear this is the positive shear on this side again these are uh, assumption that this is positive and this is positive this is the positive shear at a distance delta x1 and if this is the positive moment here Then the positive moment here is equal to the same one plus a little bit more after traversing a distance delta x1. Now we can apply Newton's equations of equilibrium. There are two equations here because we're looking at things in plane. Sum of forces equal zero and sum of moments equal zero. Sum of forces equal zero. In the vertical direction equal zero. V plus this. And I forgot the loading on the beam. I have loading on the beam that's equal to Q. Multiply by this distance. So V plus Q dx plus V plus partial V by partial x1 dx1 equals zero sorry this is negative it's in the opposite direction Up, upwards upwards and downwards and from which you will find that v cancels v and you're left with and dx1 after that cancels this delta x1 and you're left with the famous equation that says that the shear how the shear changes with the distance is related to your distributed load and since we're looking things in plane and the only variable becomes x1 I don't look at x2 and, and x3 I can replace the partial with the total, the d derivative, dv by dx1. 
and this is the first equation of equilibrium. Remember, we had three equations of equilibrium for. We had three equations of, of equilibrium uh, for a continuum, and we had three bending moment equations of equilibrium that led us to have the stress uh, matrix to be symmetric. Here, we will only get two equations of equilibrium. One, because some of the forces equal zero in the vertical direction, and the other one is sum of moments equal zero. And I'm going to pick this point. Uh, I'm going to pick this point and say sum of moment equals zero. M3 going in this direction minus M3 plus partial M by partial x1 dx1 minus because it's going in this direction plus the action of the shear force V plus partial V by partial x1 dx1 this force is multiplied by the distance away from this point which is dx1 and I'm also left with Q. So, and so this is going in this direction. Q is going in the other direction. Minus Q, dx1, multiplied by the distance, which is dx1 over 2. This is equal to 0. M3 will cancel M3. This dx1 squared is very small, so I can take these out. And I'm left with one equation that says that V is equal to partial M by partial x1. So V will be equal to how the moment changes around x1. And again, because we're only using x1 as a variable, it's dm total deriv derivative of at the moment with respect to x1 is equal to v. And hence I end up with two equations of equilibrium. In fact, one equation of equilibrium that I care for and this uh, I will use for uh, calculating the, the uh, I will use, as we will see at the end, four boundary conditions for my equation. Okay, so this is the equilibrium equation. The next thing is, what is the how my does my assumption for deformation affect uh, the variables in the equations? So originally, I have a beam. where this is x2 and this is x1. I'm going to pick a point at a distance x2 and a distance x1 and I'm going to apply my deformation assumption which is per plane sections remain plane and perpendicular. And I'm going to use small deformation and my unknown is that y which is the horizontal, the vertical displacement of the neutral axis of the beam, which is function only of the variable x1. Tell me what x1 is, I will tell you what the vertical displacement is of the beam. And then I pick this point and I'm tracing this point after deformation. After deformation, this, the point on the neutral axis, is still at a distance x1. But the point itself, because of this triangle, because of this deformation with an angle theta, 
is behind lagging by a distance x2 sine theta so the new horizontal displacement or the new horizontal position is equal to the old horizontal position minus a small x2 sine theta And the vertical position used to be x2. The new vertical position, which is th this distance, x2 is equal to y plus x2 cosine theta and I'm always assuming that x3 stays the same and I also assume that small that the deformation is small deformation is small so theta is equal to 10 theta is equal to sine theta is actually related to how y changes with x because we're assuming that this is theta we're assuming that this is equal to dy by dx where this is y and we're assuming that because plane sections remain plane because this is 90 then the angle here is also theta so this is due to uh, small deformations also because we assume that theta is very small cosine theta is equal to 1 so due to small deformations the assumption of small deformations I can write my equations as follows x1 is equal to x capital X1 minus x2 dy by dx and x2 is equal to x2 cosine theta is 1 plus y in order to find my small strain matrix I will assume that epsilon or first I have to find the, ho the displacement vector we're saying x3 is equal to capital x3 and we're then the horizontal displacement is equal to x1 minus capital x1 x2 minus capital x2 x3 minus capital x3 what do you get out of this you get negative x2 dy by dx1 y 0 and then to find the strain first we calculate the gradient of u which is a matrix made out of partial u1 by partial x1 partial u1 by partial x1 is equal to negative x2 the second derivative of u with respect to x1 here we're going to put partial u1 by partial x2 partial u1 by partial x2 is equal to negative dy by dx1 partial u1 by partial x3 is 0 partial u2 by partial x1 is dy by dx1 
partial u2 by partial x1. Partial u2 by partial x2. y is not a function of x2. Remember, y is the vertical displacement, which happens to be only function of x1. So this will be 0. And the remaining parts will be 0. If you calculate the small strain matrix, which is equal to half this matrix plus this matrix transpose, what do you get? You will find that this will be equal to negative x2 d2y by dx1 squared, and everything else is 0. which means the deformation assumption allows me to say the only non-zero strain entry is epsilon 1, 1 which is equal to negative x2 d2y by dx1 squared. So the equilibrium equation, the, con the, 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 the deformation assumption, and then the third thing we're going to look at is the constitutive law. The constitutive law, we're ignoring Poisson's ratio. When we ignore Poisson's ratio, we assume that sigma 1, 1 is equal to E multiplied by epsilon 1, 1. And since epsilon 1, 1 is the only non-zero uh, entry, I have I don't have any other entries in my uh, in the expression for sigma one one, so I end up with negative e multiplied by the strain which is x two d two y by dx one squared. So let's look at this equation and, and see what it tells me. It tells me that the stress is a function of Young's modulus, which is a constant, multiplied by d two y by dx one, multiplied by x two. E on, on one cross section, let's say I'm looking at this, at this cross section. This is x1. y is the vertical d displacement, which is not drawn here, but assuming that there is a, a small deformation. And this is x2. This e equation tells me that sigma on 1 is equal to a constant multiplied by x2, because on this cross section, d2y by dx1 squared is equal to constant. So a constant multiplied by another constant multiplied by x2, which means that the stress is actually linear. And if y, if it's actually linear and a function of x2. So this is sigma 1, 1 and the same with epsilon 1, 1. This is how epsilon 1, 1 and sigma 1, 1 change on that cross-section area. And so this, this triangular shape of the stress and the strain, the reason why we're able to draw the stress and the strain in, in such a triangular shape is because of the, the very restrictive deformation assumption that we assumed, which is that plane sections remain plane and perpendicular to the neutral axis, axis after deformation. We have already written M3 as a function of sigma on 1. So if we now put sigma on 1 inside that integral, we can calculate the moment on this cross-section area. So, and doing a little bit of integration, you end up with the famous formula that the moment is equal to EI multiplied by the second derivative of dx1 squared, where this I came from the integral of x2 squared d, which is the moment of inertia. Now, if we use the constitutive law, we will not be able to calculate any shear stress because we don't have any shear strain. So why 
would there be any shear stress? However, when we draw, when we drew the beam, we put here a shear force V and a shear force V plus part V but part X1, dx1. So this inconsistency is also due to this restrictive uh, assumption. It's almost like saying that the, the, the um, shear modulus is infinite. It's assuming as if there is shear stress without any shear strain. So there is a shear stress without any shear strain and this value of the shear stress can be calculated using the constitutive, uh, using some integration and the shear stress is equal to a negative V multiplied by a constant called Q of X2 sorry a variable called Q of X2 which I will cover in a second divided by I divided by the width of the cross-section area and please correct the typo in the new book in the ebook it's missing the negative Please correct here. Please correct typo in a book. And also we have a relationship between sigma on one and the moment because the moment is equal to e i d two y by d x one squared and sigma on one is equal to negative e x two d two y by d x one squared. So we can relate sigma on one to the moment. So what we haven't discussed yet is what is Q? And you can look at the derivation in the textbook. Q is the moment of area of, of the area above the point at which we're trying to calculate the shear stress. So if this is x2, and this is x1, and I would like to calculate the shear sigma on 2 at this point, it's equal to the following. I will take this whole area. I will call it area and then I will calculate the distance from this area from the centroid of the area to the neutral axis and I'm going to call this distance P and in this case sigma on 2 is equal to the negative the shear the shear force multiplied by Q of x2, Q of x2 is equal to area multiplied by y bar, which is the moment of the area above that point, divided by the moment of inertia, divided by the width of the cross section. Okay, so let's look at the final equations that, that we obtained. We obtain that M3 is a function of the deformation, EI d2y by dx squared. And we already know that dm3 is equal to V. Therefore, if we utilize how the moment is related to d2y by dx1 squared, I can find an expression for V. And from the equilibrium equation, I know that dv by dx1 is equal to Q. I'm going to, to replace V with the function of Y and I end up with the differential equation of equilibrium EI D4Y by DX1 power 4 is equal to Q and this is the differential equation of equilibrium that when I solve I'm going to find Y because Y is what I'm looking for that's the deformation of the beam once I find the deformation of the beam I can find 
the moments and I can find the shears and I can find the stresses and I can find everything. The one unknown that will give me everything that I want about the beam is this Y. And in order to find this Y, I need to solve the fourth order ordinary differential equation. So that means I need four boundary conditions. And the found four boundary conditions are usually given in terms of any of the derivative of y. So the boundary conditions could be given in terms, so be boundary conditions, given in terms of y, what is y? dy by dx, which is equal to the rotation of the beam, or the second derivative of the of y, but I already know that this is the moment. Or it could be given as function of the third derivative of y, which is already the shear. So if I know any of those on the boundary, I will know uh, the boundary conditions for this equation, which will allow me to solve uh, this boundary, this equation of equilibrium. The positive directions are as follows. This is positive Q. This is positive M3. This is positive shear. And upward deflection is positive. Okay, so let's uh, apply this to a simple example. I have a simple beam. I would like to find the, def the, the, the deflection everywhere, and I would like to find the stresses everywhere in the beam. Because remember, finally, I would like to find the stresses. From the stresses, I'd like to find, for example, von Mises stress. And based on the von Mises stress, I will decide whether I can uh, if this beam is safe or not. So Q is given as equal to negative A negative because it's acting downwards. And remember that the positive directions are drawn here. Positive directions for boundary conditions. Let's look at the boundary conditions for this uh, problem. I'm looking for either Y, rotation, moment, or shear. And I'm going to assume that I don't know anything about the reactions. Here, I know that the deflection is zero, and here, the deflection is zero. The rotation here, I don't know because it's allowed to, to rotate. The rotation here, I don't know because it's allowed to rotate. Moment here, well, there is no external moment. This is allowed to freely rotate, therefore, moment is zero and similar to this point. The shear, well, there is a support, so it applies a shear, which I don't know what the value is. Okay, so let's now solve the differential equation of equilibrium, EI, d4y by dx1 power 4 is equal to negative A, which is the Q, di, which is the shear, is equal to d3y by dx1 cubed, negative a x1 plus a constant, the moment, which is equal to ei d2y by dx1 squared, is equal to negative a x1 squared over 2 plus c1 x1 plus c2. The rotation multiplied by ei is equal to ei dy by dx1 negative a x1 cubed over 6 plus c1 x1 squared over 2 plus c2x1 
plus C3. And finally, EIY And this is the solution for the beam, but function of four constants, C1, C2, C3, and C4. How can I find those four constants? By solving four equations in four unknowns, because I have at x equals zero, I have y equals 0. You'll find that c4 equals 0. At x1 equals 0, the moment is equal to 0, from which you'll find c2 equals 0. at x1 equal L, the length of the beam, the, w the displacement equals 0, which means negative A L power 4 divided by 24 plus C1 L cubed over 6 plus C3 L equal to zero. At x1 equal L, I also have the moment equal to zero, which means negative A L squared over two plus C1 L is equal to zero. And from here, C1 can be found and C2 can be found. Okay, so that means I found an answer for the deflection. So now I know the deflection at every point. So this is my beam before deformation. After deformation, found the deflection of the beam but remember what I'm interested in is not only the deformation shape I'm also interested is interested in the stresses at every point so what are the values of the stresses at any point if this is x1 and this is x2 I'm interested in the stresses every point at every point inside the beam well they are all given in terms of this y because I know m is equal to EI D2Y by DX1 squared. So I have an expression in terms of, of, in terms of X1 and X2. Sorry, in terms of X1, because I have Y, I have the solution for Y, so I have a solution for M. And the stress sigma on one at every point is equal to negative whatever expression I get here multiplied by the distance x2 divided by i and sigma on 2 is equal to why the shear stress now I know that sigma on 2 is equal to the, the, the I know that the shear is equal to ei d3y by dx1 cubed Sigma on 2 is equal to negative, whatever function I have here, multiplied by Q divided by I, B. And what is Q? Well, Q is the moment of the area above the point. So if the point is at a distance x2, let's try to calculate Q for a general area. If this is my rectangular cross section and this is 
the point at which I'm trying to calculate sigma on 2 Q at this point is equal to the area now the area is equal to now the area is equal to uh, function of the cross section dimensions so let's call the cross sections as follows the height of the cross section is t the point under consideration is at a distance x2 the width of the beam is b q is equal to the area which is equal to b multiplied by t over 2 minus x2 that's the area and the height is equal to x2 plus half t over 2 minus x2 how did I calculate this? it's x2 plus this distance and this distance this whole one is equal to t over 2 minus x2 and half of it is half t over 2 minus x2 and so when you substitute all this into here you get an expression for the shear at every point inside the beam.